The following audio presentation is a production of Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, in association with the Division of Continuing Studies and the Institute on Ethnicity, Culture, and the Modern Experience. This production was originally funded by the New Jersey Historical Commission and has been remastered by the Rutgers ITV studio. Nothing says New Jersey quite like that most enduring and beloved of roadside gastronomical institutions, the diner. Now we're not talking about a sterile cookie cutter fast food emporium or some trendy place where ponytailed waiters recite today's specials at warp speed. Some such establishments around the country may call themselves diners to attract the true aficionados of eggs in a skillet or pigs in a blanket. But about three quarters of the nation's real diners are right here in New Jersey. And you just can't fool a Garden State diner gourmet like author and columnist Peter Genovese. You can count on one hand the number of diners in the Midwest. In California, there are some the imitations. They're not true diners. And also in Florida, there's sort of a, a lower quality sort of and they don't really look like the diners we know in New Jersey they're more sort of like restaurants or coffee shops where they call them diners Genovese has just completed a book called Jersey Diners after visiting each of the state's 500 plus diners to the purest a true diner must be built in a factory and then shipped to its permanent site two of the nation's three remaining diner manufacturers are in New Jersey and still produce the characteristic structures with their shiny fixtures, formica floors, and naugahyde covered stools that spin. But it takes more than that to make a real diner. The atmosphere is different, even even the newer diners. There's, there, there's just kind of a homey, comfortable atmosphere about a diner. You, you can go in there first time, complete stranger, and you you feel like home, the waitress, you know, how you doing, honey, you know, dear, sweet, you know, all these it's waitress kind of uh, terms. You don't get that atmosphere walking into Denny's or McDonald's. The classic diner developed side by side with New Jersey's sprawling network of highways. During the 1940s and 50s, the open all night diner became symbolic of a state and nation constantly on the move. Rutgers American Studies professor Michael Rockland also something of a hash house connoisseur, says the diner has sociological significance as well as being a good place to chow down. He compares it to another early 20th century American icon that was also mass produced for the nation's common people. I think people have a similar affection, an affection for diners, similar to the Model T Ford in the sense that it was inexpensive, it worked, it gave you value, and it, and it, uh, it allowed a lot of people the Model T Ford did, and the as well, to feel that they were in the middle class, that they had uh, reached a certain level of, of success. I think that's what the diner stands for. Another appealing feature is that, unlike today's franchised eateries, every diner has its own special atmosphere, its own personality. The diner is also a uniquely American institution, straightforward and unpretentious. At the TikTok Diner of Clifton, their motto urges you to eat heavy. At 1920's Max's Grill in Harrison, perhaps the state's oldest diner, a ladies invited sign beckons beside the entrance. I mean, I don't want to go into restaurants, frankly, where some guy comes over who's got a chain around his neck with a medallion on it who tells me he's the sommelier and he's going to recommend a fine wine for me, you know. That's, that's, Europe, see, Europeans know how to do that. When Americans are imitating Europeans, they do a lousy job. We shouldn't go around trying to imitate Europeans. So on the one hand, you have the fancy restaurants, which are often imitation European restaurants. And then you have the fast food places, which really are not meant for humans. And then you have the diner in between, and the diner is just right. TV also knows the appeal of New Jersey diners, shooting many a commercial in Garden State roadside Vittles venues, including the bounty ads in the legendary Rosie's Diner near the George Washington Bridge. Rosie's, by the way, was moved to the Midwest and is said to be doing just fine. But there's more to the Hollywood connection than mere commercials. I interviewed a screenwriter from Tom's River 
who does all his writing in diners. And he divides his time. He spends a lot of time in L.A. and, and, and here. But he had this funny story. One day he was at a diner up in uh, Union City, the Four Star, and he the, the there were a couple guys, rough-looking guys, in the booth behind him, and they, they were mob, mob guys. And one of the guys was complaining. He apparently was a hitman, and he was complaining that he wasn't—he hadn't gotten paid for his last job, <laughs> which is pretty. This guy's whining about, uh, oh, they won't pay me. These guys are cheapskates, and uh, that's the kind of thing. That's why diners are great. You can just pop in on all sorts of great conversations. Diners would seem to combine the best of the traditional and the modern in New Jersey. In addition to the old-fashioned favorites, many diners now offer dishes for today's health-conscious consumers. Commercials for local diners now regularly show up on cable TV, and there are even diner homepages on the World Wide Web. But the idea of good food at reasonable prices, available 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, will never go out of fashion. So let's go get a cup of joe, a piece of mile-high pie, and talk about what's wrong with the devils in the nets. It's on me. I'm Tim Espar for New Jersey Times.